This is turning out to be a very throwback podcast. Just what you've been waiting for. Movies, TV, music, and more. Follow, subscribe, stay up to date. Episodes drop every other Monday. Welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed, or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, I think we need to stop giving tributes to elderly celebrity icons, because these networks keep killing our beloved stars. Look at all the wreckage they've caused so far. Betty White. They announced a special, which would air on January 17th, 2022, 100 Years Young, a birthday celebration. Yeah, she died on December 31st, 2021, at the age of 99. Norman Lear, the man lived to be 101. All those years, no problems. A special was announced, a life on television. He kicked the bucket on December 5th, 2023 a few weeks before it aired. Now they dodged a bullet with Dick Van Dyke, but if you're wondering why they decided to do a special 98 years of magic, I am sure it's because they didn't want to risk it, waiting until he was 100, you know, just in case. But since we're talking about television specials, the Emmy Awards are on tonight, and I thought it was apropos to review a groundbreaking show on the podcast, and give tribute to its creator, Norman Lear. He was a revolutionary creator and writer, changed television for the better. When people were lapping up Here's Lucy, The Partridge Family, My Three Sons, he decided to introduce to the world a disruptor, Archie Bunker. And with him, subject matter that was considered taboo at the time. Racism, anti-Semitism, LGBT rights, abortion, feminism, poverty, the Vietnam War. Yes, my friends. Norman Lear was woke. Oh, I can feel your eyes rolling. I get it. It's such a divisive word in some circles. But the term was originally used in the black community to be woke, meaning watch out for racist threats. And of course, society took that concept from them and applied it to their own agendas. Now conservatives have convinced their constituencies that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a bad thing. They think DEI has ruined merit. (laughs) Okay, but centuries of discrimination had no impact on society. And liberals want to dox and cancel anyone who disagrees with their point of views, including those in their own party who just aren't woke enough. But the way that I approach wokeness is like soft drinks. All right, now stick with me on this one. You had classic Coke, the original, the one that hits the spot on a warm summer day. Then you started getting these offshoots of the formula. Diet Coke, Cherry Coke, Coke Zero, Coke Lime, all legitimate on their own, but none captured the magic of classic Coke. I consider Norman Lear, and I think most people identify as classic woke. We are big picture thinkers. We focus on those cross-the-board issues, the ones that affect the majority of people. We don't get into the minutia of problems until the main obstacle is resolved. It's like math. If you haven't figured out addition and subtraction, there's no way that you can do algebra. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is skip it. Two stars watch at your own risk. Three stars standard fare. Four stars worth checking out. And five stars must see. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. 
I ranked titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. On this episode of the podcast, I'll be reviewing Maud from 1972. Created by Norman Lear, the character was originally introduced on All in the Family as Edith Bunker's favorite cousin. She was loosely based on his wife at the time, Frances. The pilot was directed by Robert H. Livingston, I presume. He received two Tony Award nominations as director and co-adapter for the Broadway musical The Me That Nobody Knows. The script was written by Susan Silver, who scribed episodes of The Mary Tyler Moore Show, The Partridge Family, and The Bob Newhart Show. She was also a producer on the sitcom Square Pegs, which was an early acting gig for Sarah Jessica Parker. It stars B. Arthur as Maud, the Brooklyn-born actress enlisted in the United States Marine Corps Women's Reserve in 1943 and was honorably discharged in 1945 as staff sergeant. She studied at the Dramatic Workshop at the New School and started appearing in off-Broadway plays. She won a Tony Award in 1966 for Best Actress in a Musical for Mame. She won two Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series for both Maud and the Golden Girls, and received the third most nominations behind Mary Tyler Moore and Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Her husband Walter is portrayed by Bill Macy, another Brooklynite who served in the United States Army. He worked as a cab driver before transitioning to acting and was cast in the off-Broadway hit O oh Calcutta for three years, later appearing in the movie adaptation. Norman Lear watched one of his performances and hired him in a small role as a police officer in All in the Family, before he was cast in Maud. Adrian Barbeau plays daughter Carol, best known for her roles in The Fog, Swamp Thing, and Creepshow. Born in Sacramento, she moved to New York City and became a go-go dancer. She originated the role of Rizzo in the Broadway musical Grease and received a Tony Award nomination for the portrayal. She also appeared in The Cannonball Run, Escape from New York, Back to School, Argo, and episodes of The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Murder, She Wrote, and The Twilight Zone. The series also features Conrad Bain and Rue McClanahan. This is something to look out for. The housekeeper, Florida Evans, acted by Esther Roll, would star in her own spinoff as the matriarch in Good Times, though in this pilot, she doesn't have any scenes and appears in credit only. So let's jump into it. Maud is a strong, independent woman with liberal views. She lives with her fourth husband, Walter, who is a Maytag dealer at Finley's Friendly Appliances. Their home is located in Tuckahoe, Westchester County, New York. Maud's daughter from her second marriage, Carol, is recently divorced. She's moved back in with them along with her child, Philip, to save up on money. For the past couple of months, Carol has been late to dinner every Tuesday. Maud thinks that she's having an affair, but in reality, she's been seeing a psychiatrist. This causes Maud to feel insecure about her role as a mother and the relationship with her daughter. Here's a quote without context. If Mr. Ed ever comes back, they'll be a part for you. I'm not talking about the part that talks. Maud was an entertaining pilot. As expected, she came off like a bull in a china shop, very controlling of her husband and daughter, but it wasn't in an obnoxious way. B. Arthur played the part with a good balance of charm and bossiness. I did have some preconceived notions of the character, based on her importance in television history, so I was surprised that she was against the idea of her daughter going to therapy. Someone with liberal views would be more open and accepting of that, and Walter does mention that she's pro-therapy. But I suppose the hesitance and the comedy came from the fact that it made her question her own abilities as a mother. I never imagined that the character was self-conscious or self-absorbed in that way. It was good fodder for some very funny moments. I think for the most part the show has held up. I did put myself back in 1972 and can imagine how talking about hysterectomies or therapy openly and honestly would be groundbreaking and against the grain. I mean, those subjects weren't being talked about on Bewitched, Little House on the Prairie, or The Doris Day Show. But there was one scene with a young Ed Bagley Jr., where he was a solicitor claiming to be a Vietnam veteran. I tried to do some research to see if that was a thing back in the 70s, and I, I suppose it was, but I had never heard of it before. But anyway, my favorite part of the show was Walter. He's a quintessential supporting character, 
and had some great one-liners with a dry, deadpan delivery that gave me some of the biggest laughs. His personality is also a perfect foil for Maud and Carol. Now for a little trivial trivia. Susan Harris, creator of the Golden Girls, Benson, Empty Nest, and Soap, would go on to write the controversial two-part episode on abortion called Maud's Dilemma. Maud was produced by Tandem Productions and filmed at CBS Television City and Metro Media Square in Hollywood, California. The pilot was edited by Jim Steiner, who worked on episodes of Insight and All in the Family. The theme song, And Then There's Maud, was composed by husband and wife songwriting duo Marilyn and Alan Bergman and David Grusin, who scored The Graduate, The Firm, and Tootsie. It was performed by soul singer Donny Hathaway, known for the popular hits Someday We'll All Be Free, A Song For You, and The Closer I Get To You. The runtime is 26 minutes. Imagine that, just four minutes of commercials. Over the series' run, it was nominated for 12 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning one for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series in 1977. On the Ski Index, I give it 4 out of 5 stars. Very solid start. You can tell right off the bat its importance in television and the groundbreaking nature of the program. It was on for six seasons, 148 episodes, from 1972 to 1978. If you've seen Maud and have opinions on the series, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Moving right along, each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there'll be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. This is turning out to be a very throwback podcast. It was when I was doing some research on Maud that I came across a video of Emmy Lou Harris, Dolly Parton, and Linda Ronstadt singing together, and I was so enamored by the performance that I had to figure out what this was. Turns out, as early as the mid-70s, the three singers who had very successful solo careers were admirers of each other's work and had collaborated on each other's albums, but since they were on different record labels, they couldn't officially release an album together. The stars happened to align in 1987 when the three women created the album Trio. The lead single, To Know Him Is To Love Him, was written by Phil Spector and originally recorded in 1958, it reached number one on the Hot Country Singles chart. It was followed by Telling Me Lies, which peaked at number three. Their collaboration topped the Billboard Country albums and was certified platinum. It would win the Grammy Award for Best Country Performance by a duo or group with vocals in 1988. A second album, Trio 3, was recorded in 1994 and finally released in 1999, after a couple of years of record label struggles, again. A few of the songs appeared on the solo albums of Linda Ronstadt and Dolly Parton, but the arrangements with their voices combined gives the music a fresh feel. The highlight is their cover of After the Gold Rush by Neil Young. It won Best Country Collaboration with Vocals at the 42nd Grammy Awards. The album would peak at number four on the U.S. Top Country albums and be certified gold. I've always loved groups that can harmonize. Queen, The Beach Boys, Simon and Garfunkel, The Pointer Sisters, Fleetwood Mac. And the voices of these three talented women blend together so well. It's also incredible to think that they put their solo careers aside to collaborate and perform with each other. So I've selected a couple of videos of their performances. They're all available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Albert Brooks' Defending My Life. The 2023 documentary was directed by meathead Rob Reiner, his classmate and best friend from Beverly Hills High School. It's a career retrospective told through conversations between the two, B-roll footage of his stand-up routines, movie clips, and insights from people he's influenced. He was born into a showbiz family. His mother was actress Thelma Leeds, who appeared in New Faces of 1937, The Toast of the Town and Modern Romance. 
His father, Harry Einstein, was a dialect comedian and a radio host who died suddenly of a heart attack during a Friars Club roast of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. His brother was Bob Einstein, best known as stuntman character Super Dave Osborne, a frequent guest on Late Night with David Letterman, and a regular on the comedy series Bizarre. When he embarked on a stand-up career, he changed his name from Albert Einstein to Brooks, so he could never be confused with the theoretical physicist. He was known as the West Coast Woody Allen, which at the time was a compliment, due to his quirky, neurotic delivery. His mixture of absurdist comedy and onstage personas led in a new wave of postmodern stand-up. He released two comedy albums, Comedy Minus One and A Star Is Bought, the latter which was nominated for a Grammy Award. He would transition to filmmaking, directing short films for Saturday Night Live, and acting in Taxi Driver, Private Benjamin, and Modern Romance. In 1987, he received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor for Broadcast News. I have a couple of favorite roles of his. He appeared in Season 4 of Weeds. He played Lenny Botwin, the father-in-law of Nancy. He was only in four episodes, but they were so memorable. He did a scene with one of the sons, Shane, about assisted suicide that's uncomfortable, but he's also imparting a life lesson, which is apropos, because Alexander Gould, who portrayed Shane, also lent his voice to the character of Nemo in Finding Nemo whose father, Marlon, was played by Albert Brooks. The other is Drive. I know every award season, people talk about, oh, this person was snubbed, that person was snubbed. And most of the time, it's like, well, who are you going to take out to put in that person? But it was truly a snub that he wasn't nominated for an Oscar. He is downright scary in that role. He was an innovative comedian, a groundbreaking stand-up that paved the way for Larry David, Conan O'Brien, and Judd Apatow. I've included the trailer for the documentary in the Matt Watch That playback playlist, and Albert Brooks' Defending My Life is currently streaming on HBO Max. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me, Bab. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed, or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to MattSarosky.com for all the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness. Maud was produced by Tandem Productions and filmed at TBS television series. What? <laughs> it was when I was doing some research on Maud that I came across a video of Emily Harris. Do no, Emmy Lou. His brother Bob Einstein, best known as the stuntman character. Ooh, let's do it without tripping over your S's.